Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris, uh, as introduced, I'm a professor in the computer science department. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about algorithms for how we can assess problems, students as they're working on open-ended problem-solving tasks, which is a problem near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I'll just start with this pretty easy to accept premise that there's something very exciting going on in the world of AI. And we know this, especially if you live in the Bay Area, you see these cars driving around which don't have drivers, they are driving themselves. And that represents something to us. That means that there are algorithms that can make high order cognitive decisions. Uh, and you know, there's more to this story of modern artificial intelligence than just self-driving cars. You know, this is a painting that you might think is painted by Rembrandt. It is a unique painting, but it wasn't painted by Rembrandt. Instead, it was painted by an algorithm. And that's fascinating for a different reason. That's fascinating because it's an algorithm that's creating it's an algorithm that's creating based on very small amounts of input data. There's just not that many Rembrandt uh, pictures. You can have a self-driving car drive for 10,000 hours, but you can only look at so many Rembrandt paintings before you've exhausted your data set. So for my mind, there is this beautiful confluence of things that are happening in 2019. I don't think I need to convince people in this room about the clear societal need to scale high quality education, but that's part of it. Uh, there is this renaissance happening in artificial intelligence, and at the same time, millions of people are going online to learn. And in the intersection of all these three things is a job for Chris. I'm just joking. It's a job for a lot of us. There's this cause, which is how can we autonomously support education? And for my mind, that really comes from understanding students. Like in the center of all these three things, we can finally understand our learners to the point that we can help them. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways that confluence might play out, but in my mind, one of the first problems to look at is feedback. So feedback's incredibly labor intensive. We created MOOCs here at Stanford and we were able to deliver online material, but we weren't necessarily able to give feedback. My anecdote would be that Andrew Ng would happily teach 100,000 people by recording a lesson, but if you ask Andrew Ng to grade 100,000 assignments, he would say, probably not today. <laughs> Some domains are pretty straightforward. So when we look at things like Khan Academy, where students are answering questions which are just correct or incorrect, we can use the sorts of algorithms that have fueled this revolution in AI, apply it, and the results are relatively straightforward. You know, we can try and use a student's past to understand them and therefore predict their future. Uh, and by just getting deeper into the algorithm space, you know, we can make a lot of progress upon the, the pre-deep learning, pre-modern AI world. But to me, this is relatively unsatisfying because when I think about my children, I don't have children, but when I do have children one day, uh, and I think about what sort of education they had, I'd like it if it was something beyond correct or incorrect. Uh, and you know, when you think about the tasks of problem solving that students go through, and if you imagine something more creative than correct or incorrect, you know, there's a whole bunch of cool domains. You know, maybe it's things like doing some early programming. Maybe you're making digital images. A lot of learning happens by writing sentences. And this is a sort of open-ended feedback that I'm interested in. Unfortunately, though, once you enter this world of open-ended feedback, it becomes incredibly difficult to, uh, to help, sorry, open-ended problems. It becomes incredibly difficult to give feedback. So if you try and learn to program online, if you get the answer correct, fantastic. Uh, if it's a very simple problem that's unit testable, fantastic. But if you make a mistake for something that doesn't have an easy unit test, there's not a good way for us to give you any sort of idea of why you might have gone wrong. I got really interested in this problem. There's lots of ways we could slice it, but one of the ways I sliced it, I talked to these people called code.org, and they've taught a lot of people to program. Um, so for example, we chose one of their units, which has eight assignments. Uh, they've had over 1.5 million submissions to these eight assignments, uh, and the data set they gave us, that represented about 50,000 students. We took one of the assignments, and we paid Stanford TAs to label 800 of them. Uh, so you know, we would give them the problem, we would give them one of the student's codes and we would ask the TAs, can you give feedback to the student? And in this case, feedback was the form of, you know, there's about 20 different things you might want to tell a student, can you check those boxes for those 20, or out of those 20 things, what would you tell this particular student? It's a hard task. Uh, humans do pretty well at it. If you give the same assignment to two different Stanford TAs, they'll largely give you the same feedback. Uh, if you looked at the old ways that we could look at giving feedback, it didn't get us very far. So deep learning in modern AI is magical, right? Well, we have lots of data and we have deep learning, so why can't we just throw these two things together? And it turns out that even when we got the top professors at Stanford who focused on using artificial intelligence and applied it to this problem, we weren't able to get anywhere close to the accuracy of humans. And I'd love to tell you about that offline, why this problem is so hard, because I spent a long time engaging with why it's hard. Um, but really understanding why it's hard did leave us to a bit of a solution. <laughs> And let me just give you a hint of the insight. 
the hint of the insight really comes from inspiration from work by Josh Tenenbaum at MIT. And he was working on this low data problem. And he'd do things where he said, hey, can an algorithm learn to identify something, not given 10,000 examples, but maybe just given a single example? And for those of you guys who are familiar with modern AI, modern AI is typically terrible at that. You want to train a self-driving car to drive? Give it 100,000 hours of driving experience. Don't give it one example. Humans, on the other hand, we can do a lot of intelligence with one example. Let's just do this for fun. I want you guys to try and recognize which of these characters is the same as the one in your single training example. You guys can just yell out, is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? Yes. Okay, we can have our moment of bliss where we're like, we are still smarter than the machines. Um, <laughs> if you look at how Josh Tenenbaum solved this problem, you know, it was through what maybe in the world of education we would call something like a cognitive model, but it was using a very modern probabilistic system. He called it a Bayesian program. And it was just, you know, he could think of the generative process that led to those characters. And he could think about in the sophisticated domain that would allow for really expressing that generative model. We took that inspiration and we translated it back into the world of education. Of course, that took us a lot of effort. But once we accurately translated it back to the world of education, we figured we were onto something. And one of the reasons we knew that we were onto something is for the first time, we could get on par with humans at giving feedback to open-ended tasks. And it was really exciting for lots of other reasons. You know, we didn't need that much data. And we could explain why we were giving feedback. You know, if the algorithm could recognize also when it didn't know how to give feedback. So we got all these nice uh, asides. Of course, one of the students got an award, so that was nice for him, too. Since then, we've been pushing this idea, you know, how far will this get us? And we've been taking it beyond code. Uh, we're at the point where, you know, for a lot of these programs, we can get, or a lot of these different contexts of open-ended student work, we can get very close to humans, um, if not beyond humans. I hope that you guys have this question, like a so what? A lot of this is like, great, you can lead to academic results, but at what point will this translate into actual benefits for humans? Of course, one of the answers to that is for code.org, we give them the system that can take in a program that doesn't work and give feedback to the students. Interestingly, code.org did not want that for their students. Instead, they wanted it for their teachers. So we're building into a teacher dashboard. Uh, here at Stanford, we have an electronic way to give exams, and we're using this to have a human in a loop who can grade exams a little bit more accurately and a little bit more quickly. And I bet people in this room will appreciate this. At Stanford, when you give an assignment, so I also teach 106A, maybe that comes through here. Um, when we give an assignment to students, often we just give them feedback on their final solution. But really what we want them to learn is the process of how they got to that final solution. So if our learning goal is to teach them the process of solving problems, why would we just look at the final thing that they submit to us? So we use some of these algorithms um, and we built a tool so that we give feedback to people, not just on their final solution, but on how they got there. And we saw fantastic learning gains. Um, you know, there is this burning question. So that, that's kind of the exciting place that we're at in 2019. But maybe I want to give you an idea of some of the burning questions in our mind. One of them is, you know, we don't just see final solutions. We see flows of students. And I wouldn't say that we necessarily have cracked the problem of how to give feedback based on someone's flow. Just to inspire you, I want to give you guys a moment of learning bliss. Do you guys want to watch a million people try and learn how to program? Okay, these students are going to struggle. They're going to start with no code. They're going to try to get to the final solution. Every dot in the middle of the way is going to be some intermediate solution. Uh, and, you know, we can just take a moment and watch them go. At each of their intermediate points, we can put their code through an algorithm. That algorithm could figure out what sort of feedback to give them for that particular point in time. But what about the flow? What about their process of getting from the beginning to the end? Now, these students, the majority of students, are about to solve the problem. We don't worry too much about them. But this represents about 100,000 students who are getting stuck. And actually, if you play this animation, 15 minutes out, there's still about 10,000 students who are struggling. And in real human time, that represents about 15 hours of them trying to write a relatively simple program. Now, first of all, we can just get some empathy for how people really struggle. <laughs> So uh, you can just imagine this is the answer that starts over there. Uh, and all these intermediate things are all the ways that one can be wrong. And they're just going from different wrong answers to other different wrong answers. We don't know the answer for what to do with this data. But one thing we can do is we can take this algorithm that can understand students at particular points in time, encode their sequence, and ask the question, who's going to survive in 20 lessons? Like, who's going to make it you know, 10 hours down the road in code.org? And I just thought I would share this anecdote with you because I think it's somehow nice. 
When we asked this question to an algorithm, it gave us back the student, and it was a student that really struggled. A student who made two mistakes, solved the first mistake, tried a second solution and backtracked before they finally made it to the answer. There's a different student in our data set that just went straight to the answer, and the algorithm's like, that person might not make it. But when the algorithm saw this student, it's like, mm, what a struggle. The student's definitely going to make it far. OK, so some takeaways. It's an exciting world to think about. You know, we are just scratching the surface of what's possible. Um, there are some particular challenges to education, but there are other great ideas in this emerging world of modern artificial intelligence uh, that I'd love to talk to you guys about. Um, you know, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to leave this small sample of what's coming next uh, as a little bit of a teaser to come talk to me after this chat. So thank you guys very much yeah, for your you. attention.